Well, we're going to be talking about something I think very appropriate this morning as we kick off a new semester. Turn to Joshua chapter 24, if you would. And of course, along with the new semester, it's a, a new year and a lot of folks are making resolutions and normally they're of the physical type, you know, I'm going to diet and eat better and all that exercise and so on. But uh, I want to focus on the inside of us, our hearts. And I want to talk today about the quality of sincerity, being sincere. And uh, sincere just means basically the, the, the nature of being sincere, that's sincerity. And it's really something that's very, very important in the day and age in which we live, especially if we're a Christian, because we live in a very, very insincere world, don't we? And here in John chapter, or Joshua 24, uh, we find a very familiar passage with a very famous verse in it, but really, I want to start in verse 14 and lead up to that. Joshua says to the people, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in what? Sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, here's the famous part, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua here is talking about serving. And that's good. We should serve. But how should we serve? That's the question. Back it up to verse 14. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And so let's talk about sincerity today. Father, we ask you now to bless our time in this first chapel of the new year. We pray that you'd help us to listen carefully. And Lord, not just to get the truth down, but more importantly, to put it to practice and to be a sincere child of God and a servant of the Lord. We pray now and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a very high-tech world today, and you guys are growing up with all the latest bells and whistles at your fingertips. But boy, back before the days of even television, Entertainment basically consisted of radio. And of course, Brother Venom would be about the only one to go back that far and remember that. No, just kidding. But uh, radio was the only means of, of getting into people's homes, and it was live. It wasn't pre-recorded for the most part. And so there was, there was large radio stations that were heard coast to coast at that time. WLS out of Chicago. Some of those still have the high wattage that they had back then. And at night, they, they spanned the whole nation. Well, there was a, a radio station, a large radio station, AM station, and it was coast to coast. And they had a kiddie program on, and it was Saturday morning. And the host was, I think, Uncle Bill. You know, they always had these uncle guy names. And, and Uncle Bill was on there using his kiddie voice. Now, children, blah, 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 and this and that, and so on. And, and entertaining the kids and uh, he gets to the very end of his program and he goes now remember children brush your teeth and this and that and this is Uncle Bill signing off see you next week and there was a pause for about five ten seconds of dead air and all of a sudden you heard the normal voice of Uncle Bill saying are we off the air and the technician said yeah and Uncle Bill said well that ought to hold the the little blankety blanks for a while, and he swore over the air, and I won't even repeat what he said, but he was exposed as a complete phony, as a hypocrite. That's not sincerity, is it? And that's exactly what I'm talking about. There was a uh, baseball player for the Minnesota Twins that really was idolized in, in Minnesota for many, many years because he was a favorite of the fans. He was always happy-go-lucky. He was always talking to the fans and especially love the children. And then it came out later after he retired and actually passed away that he couldn't stand the fans and especially the children. They got on his nerves. And I was so disappointed to hear that. So it was all a front. He was, he was a fake. Now Webster defines sincerity as not being a phony. It, it's being true. It's being pure. It's being unadulterated. It's being real. That's sincerity, it's being genuine, it's being earnest, it's being transparent, and sincerity, beloved, is a very, very important quality to have. Are you a sincere student here at Masters Baptist College? I mean, those who know you, especially the one who knows you the best, would he label you as sincere? I believe we live in a world that is looking for sincerity, and I think the world needs to see sincerity in Christian people 
or they'll reject us. Now, here we find in our text, Joshua, he's up there in years, he's over 100, and he's kind of given his swan song. He's signing off, he's handing off the baton, if you will, to the next generation, and he gathers Israel before him, and he gives to them some very parting, very important parting instructions. And you'll notice in verse number 14, he says, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. It's possible to fear the Lord, but not be sincere. It's possible to serve him, but not be sincerely serving him. And so let's talk about what sincerity really is. And first of all, let's look at the characteristics of it, the characteristics of it. The first one is conviction. If you are a sincere Christian, you will have some rock solid rock rib conviction, some things that you believe and you practice them 24 seven. And, and Joshua was proven, he was tried, he had been faithful and loyal as a, a servant of Moses, and then he was given the lead. And now he had shown all these years that he had some strong convictions. They didn't die off with Moses. He kept the baton held up and the banner held up, and he kept on going faithfully. And we find out here that he now gives an admonition to the people to go on. I'm going to die, but you go on and serve the Lord sincerely. And as we read on in verse number 16, it says, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and so on and so forth. And, and, and he re, they rehearse all that God had done. And they're just kind of reaffirming, Joshua, you have nothing to worry about here. We're going to keep going faithfully. We're sincere about this. Verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, for he is jealous God. And he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve other gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Well, <coughs> Joshua died, didn't he? And time marched on, and in a matter of a few years, look in in Judges, just your next book forward, we find out if those people really meant what they said, or if that conviction they had was skin deep. Joshua, I'm sorry, Joshua 20, let me find it here. Judges 2, I'm sorry. You get into Judges, Joshua has left now, and you pick it up in verse number seven. It says, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaish. And also all the generation were gathered under their fathers. That means that Joshua's generation died off. Notice, and there arose another generation after them who knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which the Lord had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. We find out here that all that talk about serving God with sincerity was big talk, wasn't it? It really wasn't sincere after all. You know, I've heard big talk before. I've heard folks talk big when it comes to convictions, but really not live them. And so if you are sincere, you will stick by your convictions. Also, if you are sincere, you will be honest. Honesty and sincerity go together. And honesty <clears throat> is a must if we are going to be labeled a sincere Christian. There was a, an evangelist, a TV evangelist years ago by the name of, of Robert Tilton. I don't know if, if Brother Benham would remember him or not. Robert Tilton was quite well known for shedding tears on TV and looking at the camera and sounding very sincere as he talked about the need for money and uh, how he had these orphanages in Brazil and he made an appeal, a strong appeal for folks to send in money. And they did, a lot of money. Well. There was a TV show, 60 Minutes or 2020, one of those, those expose kind of a shows that did an investigation on Robert Tilton and found out he was a big fake, 
that uh, letters he was getting in and claiming to pray over went straight into the garbage. He didn't have any orphanage at all down in Brazil. He was just uh, living high off the hog and all that money that people were sending in, and he was dishonest. If you're going to be sincere, you're going to have to be honest. In Colossians chapter 3, and verse 9, the Bible says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. There's going to have to be honesty because it goes with sincerity. But thirdly, another characteristic of sincerity is openness. Openness. Now look in John chapter 19, if you would. An openness to be forthright and to be uh, honest and open. You know, they have found with soldiers, GIs, if you will, that have been in the heat of the battle and, and, and seen all the, 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 the violence and the gore and their, their comrades blown apart, that after they interview them and they ask them what happened, they are, they are completely honest. In fact, they can't be anything but honest. They have studied these men who've been through these battles and they have found out there's something about what they've been through. They're shell-shocked and they are so honest and forthright at that point. You know that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had been closet Christians for some time. But when Christ died on the cross, that was the final straw. When they saw that, that act of love for their souls, they, they came out of the closet, if you will. And we read in John chapter 19, picking it up in verse number 38. It says, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a, myrrh, a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And they took the body of Jesus and wound it in the linen cloths and in the spice, or with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And here we find out these men who had been closet Christians, undercover Christians, if you will, are suddenly being very honest and open about their faith. Finally, they're ready to get sincere. There's another characteristic of sincerity, and it's dedication. Show me somebody who's dedicated, I'll show you somebody who is sincere. There was an infidel years ago over in Scotland by the name of David Hume. And every Sunday, David Hume would go to hear a preacher by the name of J.D. Brown at the Haddington Church every single Sunday when he didn't even believe in God. He was a complete infidel, an agnostic. And his friends began to chide him that, you know what, maybe you're an undercover Christian. Maybe you really are one of them because you go listen to J.D. Brown every Sunday. And he said, oh, I don't believe a word the guy is saying. He said, I'm an infidel. He said, but you know, though I don't believe what J.D. J. D. Brown is saying, he believes it, and he's so dedicated to it, that's admirable. Dedication is a real sign of sincerity. Are you a dedicated student here at Masters Baptist College? Are you a dedicated Christian to the cause of your Savior? That says a lot about how sincere you are. There was a uh, man who became a very famous preacher, and after he was well known, somebody asked him, what is it that caused you to be so faithful and anointed and used of God over the years. And he said, well, I can only attribute it to my daddy's prayers. My daddy prayed all the time, but it wasn't his prayers that he prayed in church that meant so much to me. And it wasn't his, his uh, prayers that he prayed at family altar. And it wasn't his prayers that he prayed at the dinner table. It was his prayers that he prayed in the barn when he didn't know that I was listening around the corner to him. I knew he was dedicated and I wanted to be dedicated like he was. Dedication is a sign of sincerity. Fifthly, determination is a sign of sincerity. Are you a determined individual? You know, there are some Christians and they're so undetermined, it's kind of discouraging. And then there are some Christians, they are so determined to serve the Lord. It inspires me. My prayer is that my determination would be an inspiration to other people. I want to be sincere in that. If we are truly sincere in a cause, we're not going to quit so easily. And that's a real trademark of sincerity. What does it take to cause you to quit? Or do you keep going? Now, there's another trademark of sincerity, and that's love. Love. And John, the beloved disciple, said in 1 John 3, 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Sincerity and truth go together. And if you really love the Lord, if you really love the church 
that Christ loved and died for, if you really love truth, if you really love the book, if you really love the brethren, you're going to serve sincerely. We find in, in Romans 12, turn there if you would, what the Apostle Paul has to say about love and sincerity and how they go together. Notice it says in verse 9 of Romans 12, let love be without dissimulation. What's that mean? Dissimulation. It means insincerity. Let our love be with sincerity. All right? Let us be sincere Christians. We find the characteristics of sincerity. Secondly, let's talk about the charlatans of sincerity. Do you know what a charlatan is? A charlatan's a fake. A, a, a charlatan's a phony. A charlatan is somebody who is insincere. When it comes to sincerity, are we charlatans? There was a young man who was courting a, a young lady, and he writes her this, this love letter, and uh, it's all gushy, and then at the end, he really pours it on. He says, my dear, I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would swim the widest river for you. I would cross the burning desert for you. And I'll see it tonight if it doesn't rain. Signed, <laughs> sincerely, so-and-so. I thought that was cute. Is that sincere? I don't think so. You know, the word sincere, it actually means no wax. No wax. You say, what, what's that talking about? It's the Latin word sine caro. And what the Romans would do is they would write a document and of course, they didn't have US mail that they had at that time or emails and so on. It had to be carried by hand. So there was carriers. And so the, the Roman official would write the document, he would roll it up, and if it had stuff that was confidential inside, he would melt some wax on it and, and use his ring to seal that wax with his signet. And that thing better arrive sealed like that. It had the wax on it. And if for whatever reason the wax was gone or the rack, wax was tore open, the, the carrier was in big trouble. Well, there were some letters that were just considered open letters. They called them no wax letters. There was nothing confidential in them. And, uh, and so they would say no wax. It was a sincere letter. That's where we get that Latin word, sine cara. And are we basically sincere where we don't have any facade, any wax, as it were? We are open. I'll just say this, in the 21st century, there is a real famine of sincerity, and I've seen it get worse in my lifetime. You know, um, I've got a uh, relative, and I can't say too much here, but uh, he's, a secret, he's a, he just retired from the Secret Service. Very interesting guy to talk to. He's, he's guarded all the, the senators, the vice presidents, the presidents, all the big officials. He was a very interesting guy. What would you say if you could talk to a Secret Service man that really had, had uh, chaperoned Hillary and, and, and Bill and all these people for years? Well, being curious as I am, I have a lot of questions for him, if you can imagine. And it's extremely interesting to find out what politicians are sincere and which aren't, and you probably could, could guess pretty well from just any discernment at all. You know, there are some politicians and they say, how do you know if they're lying? Well, see, see if their mouth is moving, all right? And it's not that bad, but, but there are some that really have a, a lot of insincerity and a, a phoniness. In fact, there's one politician, in fact, this was a major presidential election years ago. We have the Republican candidate, the Democratic uh, candidate, and the Democratic con uh, candidate is especially known for being Mr. Green. Mr. No carbon emission, no, no um, oil, no none of that. Uh, you know, it, we, we have to save the planet. And the other is, is just known for common sense, all right? There's oil here, God gave it to us, let's drill it, let's use it, and so on. And anyway, somebody did an investigation on both of their homes. And the guy who's, who's no carbon, Mr. Green and all that, had a huge home that gave off 20% more, no, no, 50% more carbon than the average house in America because it was just uh, everything in it, it used natural gas and this and so on and so forth. And then they investigated the other guy who was just Mr. Common Sense and found out uh, he heated his home in Texas with geothermal heat, he recycled his water, everything about his home was eco-friendly and they said it's just the exact opposite. This guy over here is a hypocrite. There's hypocrisy and so much hypocrisy. These are charlatans basically. In fact, I think many of us would remember Years ago, when, when an evangelist from television fame by the name of Jimmy Swaggart was caught in a motel room with a prostitute. And 
of course, it happened kind of early on in the week, and his program was every Sunday, and so everybody, it was big news that week, and everybody's going, what's he going to say in his TV program next week? And so he gets up before a national audience, national television audience, and, and, and uh, he's talking along, and all of a sudden he confesses his sin. He says, I have sinned. <laughs> his lip begins to quiver, and tears begin to squirt out of his eyes. And, you know, anyone seeing that would go, wow, I, he's pretty repentant. Afterwards, it came out from his television crew, somebody leaked it out, that he had been practicing that all week in front of the TV, the, the, the tear squirting just right, the lip trembling just right. And I thought to myself, what a fake. Folks, these are charlatans. These are charlatans, insincere, all around. Can you spot a charlatan? Somebody who is insincere. A politician who says, well, I feel your pain. And you know he's a fake. He doesn't feel your pain. You know, history is full of fakes, insincere people. The Bible is full of insincere people. Fakes like Cain right in the beginning who takes a walk with his brother Abel and gets him out there and smacks him with a rock and kills him. Guys like Jacob, whose very name means surplanter or schemer. He was a hypocrite. His boys were even worse. And they, they played to, to the, the men of Shechem like, we want to be your friends and so on. And then they, they killed him. We could talk about Laban, the father-in-law of Jacob, who changed Jacob's wages 10 times. We could talk about Pharaoh, who said, all right, I'll let you go. I've had enough. And then when things get better again, he said, no, you stay here. We could talk about Balaam, who just wanted some money to pronounce a blessing. We could talk about Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, who took over the kingdom and was a big fake. He didn't love the people, he just loved the power and the prestige. We could talk about Delilah and what a fake she was to Samson. And on and on it goes. I'm just back in the Old Testament. The bottom line is there's so much insincerity out there. Look in Isaiah chapter seven, if you would. In Isaiah chapter 7, we find a king by the name of Ahaz who ruled about the same time as uh, Isaiah. And uh, this, this man is sick, and, and God lets him know he's going to get better again. And in verse number 10 of Isaiah 7, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake again to Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Notice in verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Was he sincere? He's acting real spiritual, isn't he? I'm not going to tempt the Lord. And Isaiah said, hear you now, O house of David. In other words, Ahaz, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? And this is where the famous verse 14 comes from. The Lord will give you a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive, and so on. But it, it came on the heels of Ahab being a, a big fake, saying, oh, I'm not going to tempt the Lord. And, and uh, Isaiah said, all right, get off of it. That's enough of that. Let's quit the pretending you're spiritual. You are insincere. You know, we find in the Bible men like Herod who said, uh, come give me news of this, this baby and I want to come worship him, when all along he just wanted to kill all the babies around Bethlehem. We find the likes of Judas, who gave a, a fraudulent kiss onto the cheek of the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. And then, of course, we find the Pharisees themselves who really wrote the book on insincerity. Look in Matthew chapter 22, if you would. You know, we find the Pharisees and the Herodians hating each other, but when it came to hating Christ, they, they made strange bedfellows, and they found a common denominator. In, in Matthew 22, and in verse number 15, it says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle Christ in his talk, and they sent out to him their disciples with the Herodians. Really, the Pharisees hated the Herodians. Anyone loyal to Herod, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teach us the way of God in truth. Did they mean that? No, fakes. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Now that part is true. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? They were no match for the Lord Jesus Christ, and he called them out for their insincerity. 
Later on at the trial of Christ, we find that Pilate's trying to get the Lord off the hook, if you will, but the Pharisees would have none of it. And so Pilate sees the opportunity to say, well, you know, here's your king. And in John 19, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest no less answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, where did that come from? They hated the thought of Caesar being over them, but suddenly they are hypocrites. They are so insincere. And you know, insincerity makes for strange bedfellows. And so it did here. And we would expect insincerity from the lost, quite honestly. But what is really sad is when you see it amongst Christian people or folks who claim the name of Christ. You know, when Paul was put in prison there in Rome, he wasn't able to, to wander about and preach freely and win souls and start churches the way he had before. And he writes a letter back to Philippi of how it's going there in Rome. And he says this in Philippians 1.16. He said, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Here we find a man in the, test, in the New Testament who was in competition so much with the Apostle Paul that now Paul's on the inside and unable to, uh, to serve on the outside. And here's this guy and he says, I'm gonna seize the moment and I'm gonna go for the gusto and I'm gonna make Paul look bad. And he goes about and he's witnessing, he's trying to win souls, but he's not sincere. He's hoping to rub it in. Paul says, add affliction to my bonds. Can you imagine what a loser this Christian was? You'd expect that of the unsaved, but not Christian people. 1 Corinthians 5.8 says, Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, the Christian life ought to be lived in sincerity. In 1 John 3.18, John says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In truth, being a sincere Christian. Are we a sincere Christian? When we sing sweet hour of prayer, do we really practice some prayer? When we sing onward Christian soldier, are we really in the battle at all? When we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to, to sing, do we even use the one we have as we ought to? When we sing, blessed be the tie that binds, do we get offended by the this smallest little thing in the church? When we sing, I love to tell the story, do we share the gospel with other people? When we sing, marching unto Zion, and by the way, I say this about people who can't even march into church faithfully, do we mean it? You know, do we really mean it when we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me? Do we really see our wretchedness? Remember again, love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And there are folks in this world today that are crying out for sincerity. And the world demands it of a Christian. Many of you would not have heard of Mahatma Gandhi, but, but of course, Brother Bantam, some of the others would. But he was kind of a, a little swami kind of a guy, he lived very humbly and holy, supposedly, and so on. But he was into to reincarnation and new ageism and all these other things, very, very confused when he died. And sadly, he lived with born again Christians for a while and he saw such hypocrisy in that household, he turned his back on it. And he, he believed the tenets of it as he read the Bible, he, he believed the person of Christ was a, a great man. And he made this statement, he said, I would be a Christian if it were not for Christians. And that's sad. The hypocrisy. God help us to be, to, to be sincere, not charlatans. There was a, uh, a preacher years ago over in Europe, and he was quite famous for his holiness and his godliness and his love and, and the sweet spirit. And he wrote a book, and it, it became famous, a little booklet, but it was called Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He was known for that little booklet. As time went on, somebody did him dirty, stabbed him in the back, and he became very bitter about that. And it just festered in his craw until finally he sat down and he wrote this letter to this guy who had stabbed him in the back. And he said some very harsh things in there. And finally he, he signed off by saying, by saying, as far as I'm concerned, you can go to the devil. And he wondered if he should send it. He showed it to his wife afterwards and she read through it and she went, ooh, this is pretty strong. And finally she read that last part, go to the devil. And she said, you know, this is kind of interesting. The author of Come to Jesus telling somebody to go to the devil. <laughs> and he tore it up, of course, and he didn't mail it off. 
We've seen the characteristics of sincerity. We've looked at the charlatans. And finally and quickly, let's talk about the compensation of sincerity. Now turn to Philippians chapter 1, if you would. In other words, the, the benefits, the blessings, the dividends, the, the payback, if you will, if we are sincere, I believe in the long run we'll be glad we were. And I believe it'll be a blessing to others. It'll, it'll enhance our testimony before the lost. In Philippians chapter 1 and in verse number 10, Paul says to these folks at Philippi that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Now he's talking here about the need of this world to see sincerity and admonishing those people at Philippi to be sincere. Look in Titus chapter 2. I said at the outset, the world is, is in desperate need of Christians to display sincerity before them. But you know what? Other Christians also need to see us as sincere. And our testimony amongst the brethren is very important. And here we find Paul talking to Titus in chapter 2 of his testimony in verse 7. He says to him, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Now he's talking about the testimony of Titus amongst the believers. And so the world needs to see our sincerity. Believers need to see our sincerity. May I say, we need to know we're sincere as well, for our own peace of mind, if you will. And, and, and that we can look ourselves in the mirror or we can lay down at night in bed and know that we are sincere. And by the way, if we just make a decision that we are going to live sincerely, it will eliminate any wrestling with decisions. It'll eliminate any wrestling with compromise. Should I cut corners here and so on? No. If sincerity is our guide, we don't have to stop and even contemplate that. And so for your life as a Christian, let it just be known, I'm going to just do my best. I'm going to be sincere in doing my best. I'm not for sale. I'm not going to compromise. I might make mistakes, but they are sincere mistakes. And it doesn't matter if it means more money or more numbers. I am going to do it right. I'm not for sale. I'd rather be sincere. I'd rather die right with God than to cut corners. And so let's stand for truth. And we won't have to wrestle with any decisions along the way. We are just going to be sincere, and our actions are going to be dis determined by our sincerity. There's nothing more repulsive than false sincerity. You know, my uh, older brother uh, was a cameraman in the Twin Cities uh, for a number of years. And uh, he got the opportunity to, f to video a very famous Minnesota politician. This uh, politician had been a U.S. senator, and then he'd gone on to be a, a vice president. And then he, uh, he went on to be actually a presidential candidate. I know Brother Venom probably can figure that out who I'm talking about. Well, my, my oldest brother was interviewing uh, this famous politician. And I asked him afterwards, what was he like? He goes, he was the biggest fake I've ever met in my life. He, he said, boy, when the camera would start, he would just smile and charisma. And, and, and as soon as it ended, he was the biggest jerk he had ever known. And, and my brother said he treated me like, like pond scum. And I said, what a hypocrite. Folks, there are unfortunately people like that. They're all around us. And yet, as Christian people, we need to be sincere. We need to be sincere in a number of ways. We need to be sincere in our, our forgiveness. In, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35, Christ said, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So we need to forgive, but more than that, we need to forgive sincerely. We need to work sincerely. You know, you're going to have jobs, some of you here, as you come back to Fargo. And uh, are you going to be an, an, an eye pleaser, a man pleaser, doing eye service? The Bible talks about that. Or do you work sincerely? When the boss is not looking, careful to have sincerity in that area. Are you sincere in your giving? You know, the Bible talks about that in, in 2 Corinthians 8. Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. He's talking to the church at Corinth about giving sincerely to prove their love. Also, we ought to be sincere in our love for the Lord. In Ephesians 6, 24, Paul says, grace 
be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Do we love the Lord sincerely? Don't ever lose that sincerity. You know, you say, well, I'm sincere. I'll be sincere for life. No, the Bible records those who at one time were sincere and lost their sincerity. Men like David, who as a young boy was sincere. His face glowed in his love for the Lord and in his faith. And he shows up at the battle as Goliath is spouting off. And he says, well, isn't anyone going to do anything about that? And his brother says, who, who invited you here, you little twerp? I know you just came here to, to be a big shot. And he said, no, there's a cause here. He was sincere in that. And he showed it by going down and facing Goliath. Oh, but later on, we know his episode with Bathsheba and how he set up Uriah. Tries to get him drunk. And you know the, the horrible story there. And finally, when Uriah was so sincere and honorable, David writes this letter to have him killed at the front line and shows what a fake he is. And so it's possible to lose your sincerity. In 1 Kings chapter 3, in verse number 7, as his son Solomon takes the throne, he says, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Give to thy servant understanding. And, and Solomon starts out so sincere but by the time he dies 40 years later, he has messed up his life with unsaved people. Maybe you were once sincere and not, not any longer. Or maybe you haven't been sincere and have decided you want to be. When a Christian becomes insincere, they become cynical and sarcastic and they become calloused. And even a Christian can have the attitude that James talked about in James 2, where he, he said, you see a brother in need and you say, be warmed and filled. Oh, that really helps him out, doesn't it? That's not a sincere Christian. Where is the heart to really be sincere? You know, we find a man by the name of, of Timothy, and Paul writes to him a, an epistle, and in 2 Timothy 1.5, he reminisces on his, his sincerity. He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Notice he says, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. What's unfeigned? We don't use that word. It means unfake, unphony, real. Timothy had a real faith, and he was sincere. Maybe it's time to make a decision that you don't want to be two-faced, you don't want to be a hypocrite, you want to be legitimate, and maybe in this coming year, 2023, and in this school year, this new semester, just say, by God's grace, I'm going to be real, I'm going to be genuine, no wax, I'm going to be sincere. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you now for the opportunity we have to be here at Masters for another semester, and Lord, as we embark upon uh, uh, these months ahead, between now and spring, I pray that you would help us to be sincere at work, sincere in our classes, sincere in the dorm rooms, sincere in our church, sincere amongst the lost, and sincere amongst the saved. And Father, to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror or pillow our heads at night knowing that we've lived sincerely that day. Father, may we, may we make some decisions right now to be genuine and help us now by your grace we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.